How y'all doing this morning? Up in Baltimore, we have church in the afternoon, so this is like really, really early for me. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> Let's sing together. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Thank you to our worship group, um, and we will start in 1 John. Let's hop over to 1 John. And I um, wanted to just plug a little bit of something exciting coming around the corner, uh, which is our midweek classes. We did some midweek classes last year, which uh, you guys get to choose. You get to register, submit. Um, which class you want to sign up for, we have five um, that I just wanted to mention because a lot of times things happen in our world and what we want to do obviously is be able to address uh, real world events but also uh, look at what the Bible says about those events and kind of bring the two together. Um, like someone once said, a good preacher preaches with a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. And we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to do that but Sundays are fairly limited. It is 11.50 right now so you, as you can imagine um, but we have other aspects, other ways to address those things. And one of the ways we want to do that is through these midweek classes. And so it's really cool. So one of those things is one of the classes. I'm just going to pitch them to you right now, okay? So one of them is on faith through trials. So we're going to be going through uh, a book for each of these. So faith through trials. Another one is, uh, you know, how to follow Jesus in a politically polarized world. Um, I don't know if any of you are in that world, hypothetically, maybe. Maybe you are, maybe not. Very real stuff going on. Number three is a is kind of a marriage dynamics class, which is for, for anybody uh, in, in terms of uh, marriage, just starting or more seasoned. Uh, also a, a salvation and a false doctrine class. And then finally, uh, we're going to re, we're going to run back. One of the classes was so good last time and so many people missed out. We're going to run it back so you can do it if you want. Uh, the Wessendorf's help with that. That was the class uh, uh, with. The book is called With, Walking With with God. So, um, so those things will help even as we engage those things at midweek, and we'll, we will talk about them here on Sunday as well, but um, we also want to be able to dive deeply into these topics here in the fall. So look out for an email, sign up for those, and without further ado, 
we're in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. I'll start my clicker. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28 reads, And now, dear children, continue in him that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Uh, verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called, called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. This passage for 2,000 years has been talked about, right? Discussed shared. Anyone who continues to sin has not been born of God. It's a challenging idea right away. Um, some of you might, your, your abdomen tightened as you read that. Oh, you know, do I, what do I do? Do I, I think I might continue to sin like I have sinned. Um, I, I, I'm not perfect, but is John calling us to be perfect? Or what is the question he's really driving at here? What's, what's he saying? Because John has said other parts in his, both in his gospel and in his epistle, the very opposite thing. John tells a very popular story in chapter 8 of his gospel about a woman caught in adultery, and he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? The whole point of that is, well, don't, don't judge this woman because all of you have sinned. And now here, he's saying, well, if you continue to sin, you've not been born of God. Yes? So, so what is he really driving at? What does he want us to really know? And I think in this passage, as I've been meditating on it the past few weeks, there is a very crucial truth, a very important truth that we sometimes forget and we sometimes give up on, no matter how old we are in the faith. And it reminded me of a story um, here, and I have a picture here um, of a, a village, a Nordic village. And one of the examples that came up that I wanted to share this morning is an example of uh, a, a settlement that disappeared. And throughout history, there's been all these stories, right? Imagine showing up to like a ghost town and you're like, well, people used to live here and all of a sudden they're obviously not here. And so historians and anthropologists try to figure out what happened, right? There's a mystery, it's really cool. And one of those mysteries, one of those settlements that disappeared was on the west coast of Greenland and it was settled by Nordic peoples, Nordic meaning, uh, you know, Norway, Sweden, uh, Denmark, Greg Kittleston's folk, uh, you know, uh, Greg Kittleston-ites, if you will. They were there, uh, set, they settled uh, Greenland. And so they were there, and they were there for several hundred years, but then all of a sudden they vanish. And it's really interesting to kind of talk about, well, why did they vanish? What happened? Now, they came, obviously, from Scandinavia, and they settled. There were other people already there uh, called, called Inuit, which is another way of saying Eskimo. So those people were there, right? And they, they're actually super cool. I'm going to just do a, a nerd out history. I'm going to come back. Don't worry. The Bible's coming back. Um, nerd out history for a moment. Bring it back around. But it's really cool that the Inuit people, they lived there for a long time, and so they knew how to navigate uh, Greenland. Now, despite what you're thinking, Greenland is not green. I know. Look at a map. It is, in fact, not green, and Iceland is not full of ice. They're, it's a whole thing, right? So you go to Greenland. It is very hard to live there, but the Eskimo, the, the Inuit, they figured out how to do it. And one of the cool things they did when they hunted whales, this really elaborate kind of cool technique and training that took a long time to perfect, 
was normally you hunt a whale, you throw a spear, and then you hold onto the rope. There's a rope, and you're in a boat, right? If you're in a big boat, you can follow the whale until it gets tired, right? A lot of you know about whaling techniques in the 18th, 19th century. You're probably familiar. So they whale, whale tires out, and then you can, you can kill the whale. It is illegal now. Don't do this, okay? Don't kill any whales. They're endangered. But when they would hunt, hunt whales, that's how they would do it. But Eskimos, right, Inuits, they couldn't do that. They just have a two-person kayak. How would you, if you had a rope, you would just get pulled under after you harpooned the whale. So they had this really cool thing that they made like a, a balloon of air, of seal skin, and they would, so hit, they would throw the harpoon, hit the whale, and the whale would go down, and then they would just follow it because the, the air would show them where the whale was in the water. And then they would, when it would come up to resurface, because it would get tired, it would come up for more air, it hit it again, hit it again, and then they could, they could eat the whale. They could harvest the whale and, and, and use it to survive in the tough conditions of Greenland. Now, that sounds really, 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 really hard, right? That's not something that you just do. When, uh, the, Greenland, uh, when the Greenland settlement, when the Nordic folks show up, um, one of the reasons they're probably not there anymore is that they were very suspicious. They, they thought they had it all figured out. They thought, you know what? We've survived a long time where we are. Greenland looks a lot like where we're coming from in Norway or whatever. We can figure this thing out. But what, the, what, science, or what uh, anthropologists and historians kind of look at when they look at the when they excavate the soil, uh, one thing really, really, really important, one thing that's key, is they find bones of what they ate before they died, before the, the, the settlement disappeared. And there's indications that they did starve because there's like uh, feet of, of um, they're eating like feet of uh, cattle. They're eating newborn cattle, which means they're giving up on the herd. They're eating newborns. And they're also eating like birds and things like that. So they, they were definitely on the edge of famine. Here's, the, here's where this relates. If you visit that settlement to this day, there's something you notice the, sec, the second you get off the, the plane when you walk in that area is you notice that there are fish everywhere, like rivers, streams, lakes, freshwater fish, saltwater fish, fish just falling out of trees, right? Fish is everywhere. In fact, one of the tourists who visited this place, they, they tell you that you can actually, as a tourist, go and grab a fish out of the water. Like, they're everywhere. They're plentiful. And if the tourists could grab a fish out of the water, the question is, is why didn't this settlement, there is, of the bones they found in this settlement, 0.1% were fish bones. They were not eating fish. Now, if you're familiar with where these people come from, all they do is eat fish, right? 30% of food, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, they eat a lot of fish. So why do these people, who often ate fish, go settle in Norway, and then never eat fish again? Even to the point where they starved to death because they wouldn't do it. I don't, nothing's changed ecologically so much that, that, that this was not the case. They did not and would not eat fish. And it shows us a couple things about it is number one, number one what it shows is sometimes we would rather die than learn something new. And that's, that's it sounds dramatic, but it's, sometimes it's not actually dramatic. We get so locked into thinking we know what the truth is or we have it figured out. And then we kind of turn off to what other people, turn off, turn off ourselves to what other people know or do. All the Norse had to do really was ask the Inuit you know, people to teach them, to help them, to teach them some things about that. Or they, they, they could have actually learned. But I think even deeper than that, because I do think we, are, we can be suspicious toward learning things, back to the passage of what John is trying to get at, is that we settle for far too less than we are promised in the Bible. Meaning, God promises us a life of joy, a life free of sin, a life of peace, a life anchored in Jesus. And we settle for kind of a life of um, trying to mostly just kind of moderate, contain our sin. And what John is trying to say is that you guys have settled for a life of sin. Anyone born of Jesus does not continue to sin. Not, and not saying like, okay, you sin every now and again. But it's this idea of sort of habitually, continually sinning, a life of sin. You've bought into this life that sort of sin is the best way to go and that this is as good as it gets. And sometimes, sadly, we often think, then we can then think of sin even kind of as a reward. Like that, oh, if I do well, I can, I can overeat or I can uh, indulge in this video or I can indulge in this gossip or I can use sin as like a reward for good behavior. And, and John is like, hold the horses, hold the phones. This is not what to be a Christian is. Like Jesus came, he says right here, he says Jesus came to atone for sins, not, a, not encourage you to continue in it, 
right? Not allow you to just kind of live a life of trying not to sin. He came, he stands in opposition to sin. So that there is a life out there, right? And I wonder if we believe this, by the way, there is a life to be had out there where we are not only free from the bondage of sin, but we are free from the anxieties of this life, the worry, the everyday pain that we go through. And sometimes the biggest struggle is just we don't believe that. We don't know what's there. The reality is, is that the, the Norse village, these people, they died of starvation surrounded by abundant resources. Isn't that crazy? They died of starvation surrounded by abundant resources. They would not just reach out and grab the fish. And now some people believe they had developed a taboo against eating fish. We have that all the time, right? Some of us, if it was left to like starvation or eating bugs, you're like, oh, I'll just starve, you know, I don't want to eat a bug, that's disgusting. But other cultures eat bugs, other cultures eat snails, other cultures eat all sorts of things. So we can develop taboos against it. And so maybe, maybe somebody in the first settlement of Norway had fish and they got food poisoning. And from then on, it was like, okay, the fish will, will kill you, right? So no fish. Maybe they just had this perspective toward it. We don't know. Whatever it was, they died of starvation surrounded by abundant resources. And one of the other lies that we tell ourselves too, I think, is, you know what I need? Because we can, we can struggle, we can sin. And when we sin, we feel guilty, and we start to wrestle, we grapple, we confess it. Hopefully that goes well. Sometimes that doesn't always go so well. We confess it, we share it. But one of the things we struggle with is we begin to kind of settle for this being as good as it gets, and we, we just live a life of a life that we were never called to live. Whether that's a marriage that is just constantly, constantly bickering, whether that's parenting, uh, a relationship with our kids that is constantly surrounded by suspicion and punishment, uh, whether that's just as a single, right? You just kind of go from, from weekend trip to weekend trip to indulgence after indulgence, just trying to kind of get the next thing, right? We, we kind of just, that's our life, but that's not the life we were called out of the sinful world to live. And it is, it is rough out there. It is sinful. This is a fallen world. And it's discouraging. It's painful. There's no answers to be had out there. And yet, we come in here, we get baptized, we're so excited, and then slowly we begin to settle. We compromise. We used to confess no longer. We used to get advice no longer. We used to read our Bible, but no longer. You know, we, we, we become afraid. We, get, we become slaves to fear, slaves to insecurity, slaves to anxiety, slaves to worry. And we read passages like this and we get insecure because we're like, oh, I'm... I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, this must be me. All right, I guess I'm no good. Goodbye, everyone. You know, I'm out of here. But what John's trying to do is actually inspire us that it gets way better than this. It does. But the question is, is will we reach out for the help that is right before us? Will we get the help from the abundant resources that lie just at our feet? Or will we, out of pride or thinking or just dis, or denigration or looking at another looking at another people and saying, we can't learn from them. But the real issue, I think, you know, even, even if the Inuit, even if the Norse were like, you know what, teach us that really cool uh, harpooning thing. Like, that was really cool with the, with the seal skin uh, bladder of air. Like, that would be really cool to teach. Even if they learn that, right? Sometimes we, I don't think that's actually really the key. The key is that they weren't eating the fish at their feet. And sometimes I think we fall into the trap. You know what I need? I need more training. I need more uh, intelligence. I need more learning. I need uh, to have a better house, a better job. I need to, I need to change things up, switch things up. Um, there's this great uh, video or show called Portlandia that used to go on. I used to like it because I lived in Charlottesville, and Portland is like a little bit more of a, a, a little bit more Portland than Charlottesville, but it's, it kind of makes fun of the culture. And there's this couple uh, in, in Portland, and they're like, well, we're just kind of bored of Portland. We've eaten at all the restaurants, so let's go to Boulder, Colorado. You know, it's a little bit edgier, a little nuttier, a little granola-y. You know, let's go to Boulder. And they go to Boulder, like, well, we've eaten at all the restaurants, and we've hiked all the trails. Let's go to Austin, Texas. Austin, yeah, even weirder, even, even edgier, even for us young, you know, it's kind of like a young, young parents, no, or young, young uh, marrieds, no kids, you know, just kind of like, oh, we tried all the restaurants. And they just keep moving. We tried all the restaurants. We hiked all the trails. We got, and then, you know, after Austin, I was like, there's nothing. How can we do even more than this? How can we get, and we just go from little thing, really idols. We go from little idol little dopamine hit, little dopamine hit, little idol. And we've just bought into this lie that, you know what we need is just more stuff, more podcasts, more learning, more TV shows, more movies, um, more, we need more indulgence 
in the sin, and then we'll be happier. And it's the biggest lie Satan tells, and he's successful at it. And I think it speaks to that fear that's within us. And then we, we can kind of say, man, I just need, I need, I need, I need, I need. And what it looks like is we're standing above a river of fish, and the fish are jumping in front of our face, you know. Um, it's it's kind of like, oh, there's the Eskimo, into it. There's the fish are just like jumping in front of our face, and we're like, I don't have what I need as the fish hits us in the face, you know. Like, I just, if only there was food around me, you know. I just need more friends. I need a better small group. You know what I need? A closer small group. I need a further small group. You know what I need? Is my leader's too short? He's too tall. He speaks too slow or too fast, right? We have all these things that we feel like I just need. It's, our, it's what our culture tells us. You just need a little more. You just need a little more. And man, I tell you, I am so happy sometimes. And then I go, or I actually got rid of most of my social media, but my wife sometimes fills me in on sometimes. She, she's like, yeah, this couple just went on another, they, they, they traveled again. I'm like, that's their sixth trip this year. We, we went to like the store once this year. And it was fantastic. I got to walk down the, you know, the, the aisle there a couple times. It's nice to see a few colorful images. But it, so I was happy. Then all of a sudden I see this. I'm like, man, I, we got to travel more. And in that picture, they look really happy, very happy, you know. And you have these things. I mean, sometimes it's like, yeah, if I, could, if I just did it, if I had this, and I can, it's so easy. It's so easy to have a scarcity mindset. That idea that, man, you know what, we just, the mindset is just always one of scarcity. It's never enough. Never satisfied. Sometimes we get in a conversation and someone, well, we don't have enough of this. And then you actually answer and say, well, you, we do. And they just pivot to, another, well, we have not enough of this. Well, we actually have, yeah, we have this out. We don't have enough of this. And it's like, okay, can you just stay on one thing that you're scarce about? You know, like, it's just a mindset. And it's not even really about the thing. It's that we don't feel enough. We feel like we're failing. We feel like we're lacking something spiritual. And it can't be filled by these things. And so it's not even about, well, I need to learn this really cool harpooning trick. And Yes, wisdom is good. Seek help. We have cut ourselves off way too much from the wisdom of other disciples in this church. Ask. Okay, there, are, there are seasoned, there are mature, there are incredible people, and sometimes seasoned, mature disciples too. Sometimes, not all the time. Don't, don't go crazy here. Sometimes a younger person will also show wisdom as well. And so it's good also to open yourself up to that young person's wisdom. Just sometimes, okay? I'm, don't be too uncomfortable back there. You're all so far back there. I can't even see you. I have no idea. Oh, we're good. Okay, good response. But, but are we opening ourselves up to that? But even deeper than that, I think my challenge, and which is John's challenge, is to continue not in sin, but to continue in him. To continue in Jesus. The reality is, is that Satan gets us to believe that we don't have enough, when in reality, we already have all we need. We already have all we need in Jesus Christ. And in this passage, he says, listen, Jesus came to atone for sin. He's atoned for it. And guess what? He has lavished his love upon us. You know how I know? Because we are called children of God. Us. We are called children of God. And earlier in the book, he says, if someone sins, we have a high priest. We have someone who can listen to us. It's not about whether you sin or not. It's about are you living for sin or are you living for Jesus? Are you continuing? Are you abiding in Jesus every day? Because the thing is, is that when we start our day, knowing that we already have all we need in Jesus, we're able to approach the day completely differently. That I am already loved. I am already enough. When you're a child of God, you're already enough. My son will always be enough for me. My daughter, now their actions will disappoint. I may not always agree but they're always going to be my kids. There's an identity there. An identity can drive behavior. So remember that I am God's son. I am God's daughter. Not, okay, I'm a, I'm a bad mom. No, I'm a daughter of God. Not, okay, I'm a struggling student or even, you know, I'm a really good at this or that. To get our identity, right? and even for younger folks, sometimes our sexual identity or for us in the, in the business world, our, our success, our business, our identity, whatever your identity might be, you know, you can hold your head up high because, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of God. And no matter what happens today, he's got me. He's already died for my sins. I don't have to question how much he loves me. He's already shown it. And he's lavished that love on us. And the, the secret is, is that actually helps you not sin. To know you're accepted, that you're embraced. 
right? There's always a place to come home with God. Now, if you're not a disciple today, I encourage you, yes, you are made in the likeness of God, but you're still lacking spiritual revitalization. You need to study the Bible. Figure out what it means to repent, be baptized, become a Christian. But for a lot of us today, if, if we have already done that, I want to ask you, do you believe it's even possible to live a life that, that Jesus has called you to live? That your marriage can get better. For singles, right? For, for that your sense of identity, that your, your security, your friendships, that you can be not just a good employee, but someday a good employer. That you can actually use Jesus in the workplace. That you can actually share it with people in a wise way. You can do that. You can be evangelist. Right? For the, the teens are gone, so for, I won't mention them. The teens. For the teens. No, they're gone. They're going to get their own thing. But for the campus students, right? We get so busy with campus, but I wonder what's more important, one more extracurricular activity or staying rooted in Christ. You know, we get so, and because it's the rat race, right? I got to do this. I got to get the internship. I got to get the, I got to stay ahead. My family's counting on me. Everyone's counting on me. All those things. But guess what? At the end of, of your life, those aren't the things that people will care about or remember. I will care. The most thing I cherish about my parents, and my parents have made some mistakes. This is going to be on the podcast, so I can't be specific. Just kidding. Love you, Mom and Dad. My parents have made some mistakes, but you know what I am so grateful for? That their decision to come to Christ. They built a legacy of faith for our family. And all my siblings will respond however they want to respond. That's not my call. I know I'm grateful for what they've done. Regardless, my dad quitting jobs, I mean, economic hardship at times, but I got to see their faith. And that's what I hope my kids can see in me, that those things, they move past generations, the faith that's left behind, that we already have all we need, that the, the Norse, all they simply had to do was reach out. But the reality is, is I think some of us we're, we're, we're more eager in the morning to listen to the talking head on the news network than to listen to the Word of God. We're quicker to open up the app on our phone and check what other people are doing and saying rather than open up the scriptures to hear what God's doing and saying. We're so quick to start our day on the wrong foot. And I want to encourage us, the challenge here is so simple. Continue in Jesus. And the smallest way to do that is start your day in Jesus. Start your day in prayer. Start your day in the Word, right? Some of you say, well, I struggle reading. Good. If you're struggling, it means you're trying. Keep struggling. If you ain't struggling with it, it's like a, it's like a salmon, right? If a salmon is struggling upstream, it's still alive. It goes slower. If it floats downstream, it's going fast, but it's dead. Sometimes, oh, I'm struggling, but are you, which way are you going? I'm struggling, but you're going the right direction. It's hard, but you're going the right direction. I don't like my version. Go on the internet. It takes 2.4 seconds to get a new version. You keep going. I like to listen to it. Then listen to it. But do not remove everything else, guys. Everything else just doesn't matter if we are not rooted in Jesus through the word of God. Everything else is window dressing. It really is. If we lose this, and we have in a lot of ways, and I'm preaching to myself at times, I've, I've lost this. And I've begun to put away my phone, away from where I sleep. I just, I don't want to grab it first thing and start the day off feeling, having a scarcity mindset. Starting the day off with, I need more stuff. I need more this. I need more that. I'm bad, a bad dad, a bad minister, a bad friend. I'm just bad at everything. Now let me just go hide the rest of the day, you know. Just go get through the day, hide, and then self-medicate. But instead of that, right, start the day off with, man, look what Jesus did for me. You know, read the word. Let it hit you. Pray to God. This is simple, but I pray, church, that this can be what defines us. Everything else. And you can handle it all much better, right? The, it's going to kill us if we decide to settle. It may take a while, but it will kill our faith and the faith of those around us if we decide to settle. Another way to put it is in Colossians 2.28. If you have died with Christ to the elemental spirits of this world, why do you submit to them as though you lived in the world? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use, founded as they are on human commands and teachings, even though they have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship and false humility achieved by an unsparing treatment of the body, a wisdom with no true value, they in reality result in fleshless indulgence. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. 
Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above. That we've, got, we've, we've, we've set our sights far too low. I pray that we can set our sights higher to what can be. I would like to talk today about all the sins that 20 years ago I thought were impossible to get rid of. But God has blessed me in this area. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. You guys know. Come on. But what I'm saying is I didn't believe a life free from that stuff. My brain had been addled, corrupted by these horrible things that I surrounded myself with. I didn't think it was possible. But not only is it possible, it's incredible. And here's the thing. New sins. Because every time you enter a new season of life, there's new things, right? So you can't, well, I got it figured out. But then the second you got it figured out, the kids leave for college and you go, okay, I need help. You know, I need to, there's a new season. It's a new season. So in a new season, you need help again. But the rest of your life, you're going to be introduced to new things. That's okay because you'll be ever increasingly transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And you may not be perfect, but I pray we can get darn close, church. That we actually strive to do our best. Not how much can I get away with reading per day, but how much can I read per day? How much am I able to read per day? How, not how much can I get away with praying. No, but how much do I, I want to pray? <laughs> My heart has changed. I don't want to watch those kinds of things anymore, those movies, TV shows. I don't want to talk about those people in a negative way like I used to anymore. My heart has actually changed. And you know the best way to know this as we close out is look around the evidence of the Spirit in this church. We have incredible people at Easter. We have two phenomenal sisters, Liz and Abby, share stories. And I remember thinking, my goodness, the faith, right? The, the, the joy that is evident in these sisters' lives as they come, as they just they interact. I think about just incredible people, and we are so blessed here. I think of Tanya Ross, just fabulous, incredible. Tanya Ross, as she walks around, just glowing. I mean, just incredible, serving, gone through everything. But I mean, try having a bad day hanging out with Tanya Ross. You can't do it. You can't. She just, it's just joy. It's, it's iridescent. Every joy you look, it's just a different angle of of, of God's joy. And, and it's, so it's not even about, well, you know, I went through easy times. You know, one of the other things that was mentioned about this Norse settlement was that they arrived at Greenland in a very, very uh, nice time uh, climate-wise. Sometimes we come to God and we're like, this is easy. The climate's real nice. But guess what? The cold years come. The hard winters come. And it's not going to be, I wish I had more training. It's going to be, did I reach out for the food that was right in front of me in Jesus? Am I rooted and established in the love of God? You know, I think about Roz Hennessy. Roz is fantastic. And that group of sisters, Nicole Tribble, Serena Craig, I mean, that group, that small group is fantastic. Those women, I mean, well, they shine. They shine. And it's not even like they're like, let me teach you about the Bible. No, it's just that they, 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 they glow with it. They glow with the, the Holy Spirit and, and the redemption of Jesus. You see it and you feel it. Just incredible people. Jason Sloan, who is serving every day in, every day out. I mean, sometimes I think if I'm at home and I just think about communion, he'll like lean through a window and go, here you go. Just like, uh, communion, Jason. And he'll just, I thought of it, here you go. Give it to you. Just incredible people, church. Let's not squander what God's given us here in seeing it. Sometimes you have to see it. I think about our honorable and venerated leaders, you know, Ayana and Phil Booker, who through their life, I mean, when we started leading Charlottesville, they oversaw us, man. And I would come to Phil with all these worries and anxieties, and I struggled, and Phil was just like, let's talk about joy. Let's talk about what God has done. Let's talk about what God can do. And it's in those lives and in that faith that you realize it's not so much about the game plan, right? It's about are we in Jesus? And even more so now, you know, in this season of life, for our brother Phil, he continues to show that despite this arduous fight against this horrible sickness. But he shows it. I went to go visit him at the NIH, and I got lost for 45 minutes. Phil went and found me, okay? I was supposed to go visit him, and he saved me from security, okay? I was, I was going to go to prison for a while there. Phil bailed me out. But these are the people. You know, when, when Paul prays in the New Testament, he very rarely thanks God for things. He almost always thanks God for people, the people that God has put in his life. But even more than that, church, I, this is a fallen world. And I pray we don't look for 
the next dopamine hit or the next relationship that's going to save us or make us feel better, better for a little while. But we stay rooted in Jesus Christ and his love for our sins, that we are children of God. We're not engineers first. We're not moms or dads first, right? We're not architects first or business folks first. We are children of God first. That drives every other identity. And the fallen world will attack us. The sinful world, I don't know what's going to happen. And the people I mentioned, their lives have not been free from hardship. But it doesn't matter. They, they walk with the Spirit within them. They walk shining the redemption of Jesus. It's not about my life will be easier. It's about my walking with God. The sinful world will fall and attack us. It will not understand us. This passage says, right, because it did not understand him. But it can never take away what Jesus has done for us. It will never take away our source of joy, our gratitude and peace. I pray that we all can simply, instead of having a scarcity mindset, can have an abundance mindset. We can start the day with Jesus and start the day, start the day realizing I already have all I need in Jesus and go about the day holding our head up high in security, faith, and joy. I want to close out. Um, I wanted to mention real quick, grab, reach out and grab the fish. This is one of the earliest symbols, um, the symbols used in the early church. It was a secret sign for Christians to meet uh, when there was persecution in Rome. They would use the, the sign of the fish, which is called the ichthus, if you were persecuted. But if you saw the fish, you knew where to go and where to meet. You see them on cars today sometimes called the Jesus fish. But I think about for us today, reach out and grab the fish. It is Christ, right? Um, that, that drives who we are. But I wanted to close out with a, a song that we're going to sing in just a moment after an announcement. Um, Come thou fount of every blessing. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. But here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we thank you so much, God.